If you want to be really lazy on your reverb selection, just find a reverb mode, maybe a hall or a room, depending on the genre and the feel of the song you want, and just put it on 10% wet on the master fader. It's a cheat and it's a really lazy way of using reverb, but it's fast and efficient. <laughs> Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Howdy, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Bjorgvin Benedictson, longtime good friend and creator of the blog Audio Issues, where he teaches you all about recording, production, and mixing music from your studio. He is also a prolific author, and his latest book, Get More Gigs, reached number six on the Amazon bestseller list. When I first started out in recording, the options for recording gear were much simpler than they are today. You could get yourself a four track and do some pretty cool stuff. But for the most part, you had to get into a pro studio if you wanted to actually make a record. And if you were lucky enough to do that, then you would be faced with a limited selection of recording gear needed in order to complete your final mix. But with the introduction of digital recording, cheaper equipment, and computers, the home studio was introduced on a massive scale to everyone everywhere. And with that came a multitude of DAWs, or DAWs, and an endless list of incredible plug-in choices that we have to navigate every time we go to mix. My plugin list in Pro Tools, for example, stretches from the top of the screen down to the bottom or beyond with every new adjustment to a track. This is overwhelming and mostly slows down the mixing process. To borrow from the author Barry Schwartz, mixing in the box has become a great paradox of choice where more is actually less. Fortunately, Bjorgvin reminds us that despite the many, many plugin options that are available to us for mixing, it still boils down to five basic elements. EQ, compression, reverb, delay, and saturation. He has distilled this approach into a course called Mixing with Five Plugins that teaches you how to navigate the essential concepts of mixing, no matter which plugin you choose along the way. Today, Bjorgvin joins us to talk about his course Mixing with Five Plugins and more importantly, his new book, Step-by-Step -Step Mixing, now on Amazon. And we are trying something new for recording studio rock stars as well. We won't be going through the usual list of interview questions. Instead, we reached out to you rock stars ahead of time and asked for your questions about mixing. We got lots of great submissions, and we are super excited to dig into all of your questions. Bjorgman has also actually been kind enough to set up a link for us at rsrockstars.com slash mw5p. That's an affiliate link for me that will take you straight to mixing with five plugins. And if you use that, I will get a commission on the sale, which I appreciate. And hang in and keep listening because at the end of this episode, Bjorgman's got a special deal for us that he's going to tell us about that's actually going to save you an additional, I won't tell you yet but significant amount off the course too. Please welcome Bjorgvin Benedictson back to Recording Studio Rockstars. He also joined us originally way back on episode four as I started the podcast. We're psyched to have you here, Bjorgvin. Are you ready to rock, dude? I am always. Thanks for having me, buddy. Dude, um, so uh, Rockstars, I should really let you know that Bjorgvin and I, when I say we're good friends, I'm not kidding. We actually have been meeting and talking about recording and talking about... Um, running our audio blogs and how to, you know, help all of you out for years. We do we do it every week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have a we have a secret call on Friday morning every That's week. Right. <laughs> the secret mastermind group. Um, <laughs> yeah. super cool stuff. But dude, it's great to hang out with you. Um, you know, totally. I kind of gave you a, a brief introduction. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Just sort of introduce yourself and tell, you know, people about mixing with five plugins and your awesome new book, Step by Step Mixing. Sure. Yeah. So basically, audio issues is, you know, my, our, my philosophy and sort of my mission is to help home studio musicians. Normally, my audience is kind of the the people that run their own home studios and mostly record themselves, uh, but might 
take on the occasional client every once in a while. So, you know, small studio setup, trying to get the most done with uh, as little as possible or as cheaply as possible, you know, within limitations and, and that sort of stuff. So my whole shtick throughout sort of the years has been trying to give people practical, simple and easy to apply solutions to, you know, certain audio issues, <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mix a lot of, I mix a lot of sort of just personal writing into, into audio analogies. And, and I kind of use that to, to help, help my audience solve their audio problems. Well, you're, you're a musician yourself. You've gone through the whole home studio experience, right? Like you really understand it. Yeah. So I have a, well, a sort of a musician and audio engineer have been for half my life. And, uh, now I currently run a small home studio called the Icelandic embassy studios with a friend of mine here in Tucson, Arizona, we, we record local bands here. Now, why in the world would it be called the Icelandic embassies? <laughs> because I'm originally from Iceland, born and raised and been living in the U S for six years. And I'm, I'm just milking it for all it's <laughs> milking my <laughs> my Icelandicness for all it's all, all well, it has. <laughs> well, I have to say, man, it feels cool to have an, an Icelandic friend. I don't know that I have any other friends from Iceland, uh, and I need to <laughs> I need to change that. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy to be of service for sure. Uh, yeah, so like Icelandic Embassy Studios, and then I that's sort of my home studio and my home office as well, and I do a lot of writing. Uh, here as well. Um, I, I have a, a bunch of products out, mostly eBooks that are some, you know, accompanied by certain video, you know, materials that sort of help to explain the topics better. But I'm doing a lot of writing uh, standalone books now and actually mixing with five plugins, my one of my flagship courses, it's basically uh, my biggest course that I have on audio issues. I took this video scripts and I was going to edit it into sort of a companion guide, but then those scripts sort of took on a life of their own and just became something much more than just, you know, as some extra scripts to a video course. So I converted it into a standalone book. So they are, you know, separate things, but they have sort of the same running theme of if you know how to use EQ compression, reverb delay and saturation, you're very close to being able to troubleshoot almost any audio problem, especially during the mixing phase. Obviously, you know, for other problems that are uh, more specialized, like noise reduction and that sort of stuff. But that doesn't fit within the scope of the book or well, the course. So, so I can't help like conjuring up this image about, you know, me, I'm, I'm sitting here living in this kind of typical, um, you know, over busy urban environment with thousands of plugins available to me and, and, you know, cars honking on their horns and traffic outside of my studio. And yet somehow you've taken all that and distilled it down into this, you know, simple, essential elements. You know, maybe that's the Icelander in you. Is it an Icelander? Is that how I say that? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, maybe it's the yeah. Icelander in you. You know, I, I picture you've got like, you know, a very rustic fisherman's shack on the the <laughs> rocky coastline, you know, and bitter cold, and you, you've only brought the very few things that you need to survive. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be far off, but I don't have a lot of fisherman's blood in me, unfortunately. But, you know, <laughs> so, some blue-collar blood for sure. <laughs> All right, cool. So so the course that you really dove into is Mixing with Five Plugins, but that when, what you took away from that and distilled down into a book is step-by-step -step mixing. Um I like the way that you take it and you kind of, again, simplify it and then you try and lay it out into something that makes it a lot easier for somebody who's maybe new to this, figuring out how to get through this process and navigate all this new territory. Kind of break it down for us a bit. Tell us about what, what the course is, what the book is, whichever one you want to start with first. In step-by-step -step mixing, I start by sort of, you know, giving some basic generalities of things to think about before you even start mixing. I like to you know, destroy the notion that you somehow need one particular DAW or you need one particular plugin. When I say five plugins, I mean any EQ, any compressor, any, you know, five processors in a way. Plugins just has a better, better ring to it, I think. Um, and, but before that, you, you know, you kind of set up 
you set up your mixing session and talk and, and I spent some time doing, giving you some uh, tips and tricks on how to organize and be efficient and faster at mixing. Because if you want to, you know, get mixing jobs and say you have a flat rate for mixing and if you can crank out a high quality mix in two to four hours uh, instead of eight hours, you've essentially doubled your rate because you have so much more extra time. Yeah. So being efficient is very important to just being able to take on more work and then and therefore, you know, make more money in a way. If you're reading the book, you can kind of just like read the entire way through or you can read it while you're mixing, you know, or you can also read it uh, when you have a particular problem. Say you have an EQ problem. Um, the book is kind of divided into two parts. One is the theory of, you know, explaining how all the stuff works, what all the buttons do, you know, what Q is, what frequencies are and what, you know, how to use the plugins and the same for compressors, uh, what the ratio does, what the threshold does and all that sort of stuff. But then every, um, the second part of every chapter is sort of this easy to use, simple, practical tips that I like giving people. And it is uh, more or less just uh, if you have this problem, then try this. If you have this problem, then try this. Uh, because there is no real one way to mix any song. You can get five mixing engineers the same tracks and they'll all deliver different mixes that all sound good. They just have different subjective tastes. Yeah, well, that's perfect, too, because with all the questions we've got lined up for today, I think this will be a great way for us to just jump in and start sharing some practical tips. Yeah, totally. And then in the course, in the Mixing with Five Plugins course, it's sort of the same thing. Uh, half the video is sort of talks about the theory, and then we actually work through one song. And there are more, more multi-tracks available within the uh, membership area. But in the video, I only focus on one track and sort of give you, you know, all the theory behind all the plugins and then a bunch of practical tips to use, whether you want to mix along or whether you want to mix your uh, your own song. And then we have a Facebook community that is uh, pretty good. They share their mixes and that sort of stuff. So sort of yeah. a support group that comes with the course. Well, I noticed on the Mixing with Five Plugins page, there were some great examples too that you could click where you'd hear somebody who went through the course and you heard the mix that they started with. And then after they went through all the videos, you know, there was this huge improvement. It was cool right. to hear. Yeah. Well, so do you want to kind of break it down into these five elements a little bit more? Just kind of give us a brief introduction to them, and then we'll dive into the questions that people have for us. Um, sure. I mean, I think it'll all sort of come out once we start doing the questions, if you want to just do that. Okay, groovy. Yeah. Well, um, here we go. The very first one that comes in is uh, specifically about EQ, so that'll be a good start. Yeah. This, this one comes in, uh, and again... Rockstars, uh, we reached out to you and asked for your questions, and you were incredibly generous and sent them in. So really excited. Got a whole list of questions from you. We want to just jump in and answer them. This one comes in from Caleb, and uh, Caleb says, uh, he's got a couple of questions here, but the first one is, would you be able to cover a little bit about linear phase EQ and when to use it? I'd love to hear you guys explain the nuances of the EQ phase interaction. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I would, I, you know, something does come to mind right away for that, which is w one of the plugins I really enjoy using is the FabFilter Pro Q too. Absolutely. And that's pretty cool because down at the bottom, you can actually select um, zero latency mode, natural phase, or linear phase. So you mm -hmm. really are faced with those three choices every time you use the EQ. Bjorkman, do you want to talk about what that means to you? And, and we can dig into it. I'll, I'll answer as well. I'm really not that familiar with the difference between linear phase EQ and normal EQ, other than knowing that I use just normal EQ on in the mixing phase, and then I use linear phase EQ during mastering. Uh, it yeah. has, you know, I've I had just haven't dug into the the nitty gritty technical details of it or the well, physics of it, really. The good answer to that is probably it hasn't really mattered to you. you know, it's <laughs> like, I mean, honestly, it's like if you're mixing and you're faced with options and you try them out and it doesn't really seem to make your record better one way or the other, then I think you're inclined to just kind of use, you know, not worry about it, which is as valuable a response as anything, as knowing everything that's going on behind the scenes sometimes. But uh, um, I, I can tell you this, so... Phase introduces uh, a little bit of delay into mm -hmm. different frequencies. 
You know, right. you think about a signal, a complete sound, and if it's delayed, then the entire sound, you know, is a little bit later, right? So it, it happens a moment later, so it's delayed slightly. But what's interesting about EQ um, is that you can actually delay different portions of the sound. So you can have, you know, the lows are in phase and the highs are in phase, but if you manipulate the mids, you might actually be um, delaying the mids slightly against those other frequencies. And mm -hmm. that can actually cause, you know, sort of a smearing of the sound and a smearing of the, you know, a, a, a defocusing of the sound. Right, and, especially in the low ends. Right, right. And um, that could be a cool thing. You might hear it and go like, sounds great. You know, that's exactly yeah. what I expect from that sound. Or you might decide that it's changing things in a way that you don't want them to be changed. So right. what linear phase EQ does is it actually it <clears throat> does, you know, higher end calculations to try and make sure that when you EQ something, it doesn't shift it in time at all. Um, right. <clears throat> And what? I think that's very important when when you're doing mastering because you have so many instruments in this you know stereo mix that that it's it it'll skew it'll skew the phase even you know even worse. Yeah, well, and you're at the mastering point. You're probably thinking, I really want to just um, like I already like what I've got. I'm just trying to yeah. to adjust it slightly, but I want to be kind of transparent. So that's a good way to describe linear phase EQ is that it's a great tool to use when you're trying to do something very transparently right, know, with EQ. Right. Um, yeah. now, now, the natural phase on the fab filter, for example, is meant to um, closely emulate an analog EQ, I think, you uh -huh. know, whereas so, so is zero, la zero latency, but zero latency, as you can imagine, does what it says. So when you put that zero latency EQ on, it's meant to not add um, any latency to your sound your signal chain, you know, yeah. which can be a really useful thing when you don't want to start time shifting stuff um, or right. have to have a lot of delay compensation going on in your DAW. And um, the natural one, I think, is sort of more closely resembles analog, adds a little bit more latency, um, but, you know, sounds more like an analog EQ, which can be a great sound. And if you're familiar with that, then you might, you know, adjust it like that and go, well, that sounds like EQ to me. Yeah. You know, more right. so than, than linear phase. Yeah, I don't think I've actually experimented with the the middle option there. Well, I use Fab Filter all the time, but yeah, but you know, I use it, those two modes. Yeah, it always defaults to the yeah. zero latency, and it sounds killer. Yeah, and I've actually done zero latency, and then I switch it over to linear phase, and I don't like it. <laughs> and I go back <laughs> right. to the zero latency, and <laughs> right. it's weird because I think that in your brain, you're kind of something in your mind is telling you, well, this other one must be the, you know, the better choice. Um, and sometimes you have to just accept, you're like, wait, wait a minute, the choice that sounds good to me is the better choice, you know? Uh, yeah. And I, I'm talking about the Fab Filter plugin. They also have the MS mode and the stereo mode. And yes. uh, I've started experimenting with this and I haven't quite um, done enough, you know, done enough work on it to to f see whether it's actually like very, very good to do. But I've started using the um, MS mode during uh, either on my master bus while mixing or when I'm mastering to use it um, to cut the lows in the sides. So like, yeah. there, you know, below maybe maybe 100 hertz or whatever, there's nothing in the sides that's just in the middle. So it sort of anchors the mix a little bit more. But yeah. I haven't done enough uh, experimentation to feel whether it, whether it's just confirmation bias or like or just a placebo effect because I think it's a cool trick, uh, or 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 not. So, well, I do that. Um, I also use the Brainworks BX2 EQ, mm -hmm. and it has that mid side feature. And a lot of times, I'll just I'll roll off the lows or I'll cut the lows in the sides. Yeah, because uh, you know I don't really think I need them. You know, right. again, it's a by ear thing, but I'll definitely. Cut out subs, you know, I might roll that up to yeah. 30 hertz automatically. Oh, yeah, for sure. For um, sure. All right. Well, so here's another question from Caleb. He says, um, how do you deal with really sibilant vocals, both on the tracking and mixing end? Uh, some people just have crazy S's. I like that. It sounds like, you know, a guy selling TVs in New Jersey. <laughs> that is an area where sometimes my regular tricks just don't work. Yeah, so... I thought about this a little bit, and I think it does come down to a f certain choices uh, 
in the tracking and the mixing phase. Um, I I haven't done this for sibilant vocals per se, but uh, a, one of one singer I remember that uh, there was a particular mic that just works better on her because every other mic had um, uh, just kind of made her sound a little nasally. So kind of had a honkiness in that 1K area. And then the mic that really worked for her was the uh, C414 of the AKG 414. And uh, then I, when I looked in and checked out the frequency response of that particular mic, it has a dip in that 1K area. Interesting. And so I thought like, oh, okay, maybe that's why, you know, it sounds like such a good mic is because it's it's not listening as well as the other ones to that particular area in her voice, making it easier to mix and, you know, less problem less problem solving during the mixing phase. I also have a 414 and I think mine's an older one, like the, uh, I might blow the uh, name model number yeah. here, but I think it's the B-U-L-S uh-huh. and um, it doesn't have the gold screen on it. I, I feel like the newer ones with kind of the gold screen tend to be a little bit brighter in the mids. So uh-huh. they might have a different kind of thing, but yeah, yeah, same thing. Like I've used that on a female voice before and it just gives you a smooth sound. It takes off all the, the edge, you know, that might right. be too much. Yeah. So just for sibling vocals, a lot of time it's, um, you know, doing some mic testing to see which one sounds better and which one is attacking the problem you think the singer has in this in this case sibilance, uh, and then in the mixing phase, I just you know make sure that uh, my deesser is set correctly, and uh, you know or or you can or you can cut in those areas just using EQ, but I think a deesser works a little bit better because it's more specific, more more of a specific tool for this particular purpose. Yeah, well, I I, I got a couple of thoughts on that too. Another thing that I might do. Um, in the tracking stage is um, <clears throat> you can also have a singer slightly sing off mic. Yeah. So if the okay. S's are sort of hitting the mic straight on and then you just pivot a little bit and sing and just kind of imagine that your sibilance is like a laser beam, just just sort of aim your laser so it's not hitting the, the diaphragm straight on. And that can also really help, you know? Right, right, for sure. And uh, another mixing <clears throat> trick would be to, instead of using a de you could experiment with uh, using saturation and mild tape uh, tape saturation, tape warmth, because uh, technically it does dull the higher frequencies a little bit. You know, just in general, that's what saturation does a lot of times. And uh, sometimes sibilance actually repeats itself as a harmonic in the upper register. So maybe... If the sibilance is very prevalent in 7K, which is like the standard frequencies to start hunting out in, it might also be noticeable in 14K, which is, you know, the second the second harmonic of, of that. But instead of, you know, having a bunch of de all attacking different frequency areas, uh, using saturation to just sort of dull the highs might be a good uh, option as well. Yeah, totally. Just kind of smooth it out with some analog tape or something like that. Right, because it, if you have a lot of sibilance, you could theorize that that basically also means that your vocal is a little bit bright as well. And if it is too bright, it might be sticking out of the mix too much as well. So saturation can help it blend a bit better too. Well, another nice thing that saturation does, especially when you're talking about tape saturation, is tape has a built-in compression. It actually mm-hmm. has a dynamic compression to sound. So it actually helps to just kind of squish your vocal sound together a little bit more, it compacts it, you know, and it can give it a greater perceived loudness as well that allows you to turn it up a little more. So it's great for that. Um, one of my favorite DSing plugins is the Massey DSer. I use that all the time. And yeah. I wouldn't hesitate to use two of those, maybe even three if I had to, because sometimes you dial it in at 7K and you kind of find the frequency that's bugging you, but there's something else that's sticking out. And, you know, right. don't don't be afraid to put a second instance of it on there uh, on the track and then just kind of dial in the frequency to a new spot and, and treat that as well, you know? Mm-hmm. Cool. All right, cool. So this one, uh, next question comes from um, Daryl. And uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, or uh, and he says, uh, I'm trying to mix down a song and I'm struggling with my kick drum. I can't seem to get this one. It either gets muddy trying to EQ or I lose it when I try to compress. 
I'm frustrated because this is the first time this has happened and I can't figure it out and I need to get the song done. Help in all caps, exclamation point. <laughs> I totally feel you, Daryl. Um, I'm, I apologize that the, uh, the time frame of your question and the answer may not be, you know, I don't know how soon you need to get your mix done, but hopefully this will reach <laughs> you in time. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure what he means, lose it. Does he lose the muddiness or, or whatnot? But uh, just in general, muddiness uh, for me is just sort of hunting down and hunting around in the low mids uh, with, you know, a frequency cut uh, trying to clean things up. Um, and having a frequency analyzer can help if you, uh, if you don't really know, you know, where muddiness should be, or you can't seem to find the frequency, uh, having a, an analyzer that, you know, shows you graphically where there's more buildup than other than, than in other areas. It's, it's a good starting point to do that. I actually do have, um, a report that's free. That uh, at audio-issues.com slash uh, fix muddy mixes, I have a six-step um, sort of guide that gives you a bunch of tips and tricks on how to how to fix muddy mixes. But uh, for compression, I don't know if it, it, does he mean lose it by like it doesn't it com it compresses it too much and it doesn't. Um, That's what I'm guessing. Good. I mean, I, I, we got all we've got is the question written here, but I'm going to guess that it means that it, when you start compressing it, it, you lose it, and it makes sense because you're actually bringing the volume down. You know, right. so you would lose it in the mix. You'd have to sort of bring it back up, and yep. you probably need to EQ it before compression. Um, maybe we should also throw out some places to look for those muddy frequencies. I think that I would say that if you're inside the kick drum, if it's something like what I use, a AKG D112, and you're inside the kick drum with your mic, that the muddy frequencies might be around 200, 250, and if yep. you, you know, hertz, and if you really pull those back out, I mean, you you might suck 12, 12 dB out of your sound to get it to sound right. That'll make it sound a lot more like a modern, focused, tight sound. Yep. Um, you know, you gotta you got to trust your ears. You don't want to overdo it. If you change the nature of the instrument, it's not, you know, it's going to be a new thing. You got to yeah. like like what you end up with. Yeah, for sure. But if you're okay. outside the drum, you know, if it's a front head mic, that's sort of more of a pillowy sound. And mm -hmm. um, where would you say the pillowy stuff is to sort of pull back? Well, I was thinking normally when I get a kick drum that kind of sounds like it might, feels like it has a blanket over it. It is just like not muddy in that in that sort of way, but the sort of has that boominess. That's more like that's a low, that's a lower frequency for me. I usually start hunting in 100 to 150. Yeah, uh, that's sort of what I was going to say too. So yeah. it kind of depends on what the sound is, but anywhere from 150 right up to 250 and 300 are probably great places to start sweeping a cut and just yep. look for something that seems to tighten up the sound a lot. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, and then again, Daryl is, uh, you know, don't be afraid to make that a pretty big cut, you know, cutting 12 dB is that's yeah. fine. If it sounds better there, you know, you might be only doing a tiny bit and then not, you know, not hearing the results cause you're not cutting enough. Although it's interesting that, that you say, Daryl says that it gets muddy trying to EQ. So it's probably, um, you're probably just trying to boost stuff and then yeah. that's making it worse, you know? Right. I'd say that was my first error in trying to get kicks right is um is I thought you know I'd hear something that had great low end to it and so I'd go and I'd start boosting all the low end on my kick drums and that will tend to make your kick drum sound really muddy. You, yep. you a lot of times you want to cut out the bad stuff first and then and then start adding a little bit if you want. Yeah, for sure. I I do I tend to start by filtering out a you know Generally on a kick drum, maybe 32 hertz, just to get rid of all that like lower rumble, and then um, then I cut anywhere in the mids, especially getting rid of boxiness is a big big problem, big issue. And then from there, I uh, if it's still kind of boomy or muddy, uh, I'll I'll try to clean up in the low end a bit more. Yeah. So one last comment about the cutting the 32. Um, you use the content, you know, getting rid of the low rumble. I think what confused me or what has confused me before is thinking that it, you know, rumble makes it sound like there's something I should be able to hear going on down there. And 
a lot of times where you're mixing, you don't really hear it so much as you know it's there and you know it's affecting everything else. Yeah. So um, rock stars, you know, try cutting some of those, you know, sweep your cut up until you do hear it and go back and forth until you really get a feel for in where I'm mixing. This is where I begin to hear that cut, you know, taking away something that I want in the kick drum versus I don't even hear what it's doing down low. And, um, you know, if you're really not sure, split the difference, go a little bit extra into the territory where you're not hearing what it's doing and then just stop there and know that you're you're getting rid of frequencies that you may not hear with your ears so much, but they are uh, frequencies that are causing your speakers to move in and out while they're trying to reproduce all this other frequency in your mix. And mm-hmm. that is the kind of stuff that sort of, you know, steals a lot of energy from your mix and and sort of hurts things down the line and causes distortion in the master stage and all that. Right. I wanted to give him a couple of different tips for the compression part of his question. Uh, I don't know if, if you're losing it because of because it's like dying in the mix, make sure your makeup gain is, is actually compensating for your compression so it's, it stays relatively the same volume. Um, if you're losing the the snap of the beater so like the kick isn't kicking through the mix make sure your attack isn't really fast because if your attack is fast uh and you're compressing hard it'll kind of eat up that initial transient and it won't be as uh won't be as uh present in the mix so yeah, tweaking tips. the attack and release and and then trying to find the compression uh gain reduction that you want is is probably uh is a good start great great tips man All right, so shall we move on to the next one? Yeah. All right, so this one comes in from Mark, and Mark says, uh, he says, I vote for reverb. This Uh is a difficult thing to get right, particularly given today's dry vocals trend. So it's not really a question. It's more like, um, hey, can you guys talk about reverb, especially when everything's got so many dry vocals? So what does that mean to you? Um, I don't. I didn't realize there was a dry vocal trend. <laughs> I always feel like there's there might be not as much space being used today, but there's definitely a lot of effects, and there's always a lot of layers going on, especially in pop music. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes what's frustrating is that you sense that there's a lot of effects, yet the vocal still somehow sounds dry and present up front. You right, know? right. And right. so maybe we can just talk about the challenges that you run into with that and um, what are some ways to have a vocal that's in your face but still feels like it's modern and it's got effects and stuff going on right i think a lot of it um a good sort of start there would be um especially if you have a a big reverb that you want to use but you don't want it to kind of wash out the vocal is to use pre-delay so that the vote the reverb doesn't get in the way of the vocal until the vocal has started singing you know yeah. so it's not so you're not hearing the reverb and the vocal at the same exact time you're kind of delaying the reverb a little bit behind the vocal uh making making it a little more intelligible um and then eqing your reverbs is is a, very important to you know sort of make them fit better um i tend to Always filter out the lows and filter out the highs uh, to where it's really dependent, depends on uh, what I'm doing or what instrument is being reverbed. Uh, but I find that re- uh, doing a filter in the lows all the way up to the low mids uh, makes it much, makes the mix much cleaner. And then um, in, the, in the highs, I tend to roll off a lot of the highs too because I don't want that really bright uh reverb sound that sort of was i guess pretty prevalent in in the 80s not in the big 80s reverb style it's just like they tended to have brighter reverbs as well and then of course overused them (laughs) but uh uh but it also helps because if you roll off all the highs of the reverb you're also tackling the sibilance problem uh we sort of talked about before because if you have a sibilant voice and you send it into a reverb and you don't EQ the top off, then you're just adding more sibilant through the reverb as well, and you you want to avoid that as well. Yeah, I think you covered pretty much the same stuff I was going to say. So pre-delay is the first trick to just pull that reverb away from the vocal some more so that you really hear the the dry vocal first, yep. and then the EQing. Because when you, you know, I've got a plate reverb here in the studio, 
And if you just put that on the whole mix without EQ, it sounds wonderful, but at the same time, it's a lot of energy, you know, down all going all the way down to the lows and up in the yeah. highs. And yeah. so you can really focus it more when you when you begin to roll it off. Yeah. You can also do um there's a trick where you can also kind of put in a little bit of a dip around 1K too as mm -hmm. well. Right. Yeah. So, and that's, uh, that sort of EQing things out of the way of the vocal isn't just for reverbs, but that also works for other instruments. Say you're, um, if you want to make your backup vocals kind of get out of the way of the lead vocal, but they're equally as loud, you can sort of EQ out a, a fairly wide cut maybe from 900 Hertz to three kilohertz. Uh, and that sort of that dampens the uh, clarity and sort of the intelligibility of the backup vocals, making the lead vocals more present in the mix. Yeah. It's you know, kinda, blends them better. It's smart. It's like if you want to hear more of something, you don't necessarily have to turn that thing up. Yep. Yep. And then one of the one of my best uh, EQ lessons that I've learned uh, in the last year or so was uh, EQing while listening to something else. So when I'm EQing, um, say I think the bass is getting in the way of the vocal, uh, but I'm EQing the bass, but I'm actually listening to the vocal, not listening to the bass. Yeah, uh, that's so you're, smart. You're EQing to problem solve a different track to make everything fit, because that's the ultimate goal of EQ is to make everything fit, and um, and you can hear everything well in the mix. I love you know, to a certain extent. I love hearing about stuff like that because it's it's like a trick that's not about the tool, it's about your brain. <laughs> right. It's right. about tricking your brain to do something different. Right. Right. All right. So um let's go to the next one. This one comes in from uh Gordon and he says, um, you know, when you're EQing two or three things in the same frequency range and you don't want them to clash. He says, what I've seen is to raise and lower the different frequencies in the different instruments so that they sit better together. But how much do you raise and lower without actually affecting the sound of the track itself? Right. So it's more of the same thing you were just talking about. But I guess maybe the big question here is, you know, you must be feeling a little nervous about, you know, doing too much, you know, like you're overcooking it. What do you think about yeah. that? Well, I... I think the biggest um, thing to think about is to make sure that you're doing everything in context with everything else. Uh, because if you are increasing too much, say you're like cranking up 12 dBs, and if it starts sounding really, really weird and uh, abnormal, obviously that's not the right thing to do. Um, but I don't think you should be worried about it unless it starts sounding weird to you. Uh, and maybe... Maybe you also might want to have um, sort of a good eye on, or uh, for instance, the FabFilter Pro Q2 has an automatic uh, level compensation. So if you are EQing, it also sort of looks at your levels because otherwise you'd have to you'd have to uh, lower the level of the fader because if you're increasing. Uh, one frequency range a lot, you're basically increasing the volume of that frequency range and then and by a certain percentage increasing the overall volume of the track. So if you are increasing the volume a lot and it starts sounding weird, it, does it just sound weird because it's so loud? If you lower it into the mix, does it lower into the mix and then f sit in the mix or does it still sound weird? Yeah, I guess that pretty much answers that question. So let's move to the next one. This one comes in from Charlie, and uh, it looks like a couple of questions here. Charlie says, how do you go about bus compressing different types of genres? Hard rock versus acoustic versus vibes, retro, or multiband. Um, so what do you want to say about that? And I think we're talking about the two mix, probably, you know? Yeah, yeah. So like not in mastering. Um I do. I mean, on I usually put a master bus compressor while I master. It's one of the first things I do because I tend to do uh, sort of a, a hybrid approach. I like to call middle out mixing, which is, you know, sort of doing top down mixing, um, and then going on to the subgroups. Uh, it's sort of I, I slap a compressor on the on the master, but then I actually work on the subgroups first. And then if, if I need uh, more detail or need to EQ something out or whatever, I'll go up and add more plugins on the master fader. So it's sort of a hybrid. Uh, 
And I talk about that a lot in step-by-step mixing because they're all very relevant things to, uh, or, you know, you can, it, there's no one way to do it. So you can jump around as much as you want. But is, I is do, that a nod to, um, to the TV show, Silicon Valley, middle out <laughs> compression? <laughs> yeah, sort of. I mean, it, 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 it just has a good ring to it because it's sort of a literal, but I love that show. So I might've been subconscious. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorites too. We won't, we won't talk about what the, the skit that they did around that. We'll leave that for, uh, um, for a yeah, different if you, show. <laughs> if you know, if you know it, you're laughing, but if you don't know it, you might want to check it out. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and I, when I do master bus compression, I tend to try to be very subtle about it. Just a couple dBs at most, uh, low ratios. Um, and I think, I would say that I do the same, whether it's a hard rock or an acoustic song. You know, it's just a little bit of glue to like push things together. And then, depending on the genre, I might I might hit I might go to the sub mixes and I might hit the drum group a little bit harder in a rock track than I would in a folk track, or I might hit them a little bit differently. Um, and uh, he also asked how much difference does tempo make. And I tend to just try to make sure that that the that the gain reduction is is you know is resetting uh, pretty pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, um, I'll jump in and make a couple of comments on that too. I think you're absolutely right. I think that the stereo bus compressor, if you put something across your stereo mix, um, little to seeing little to no movement at all is a great place to be. You know. Uh, there's a tendency we'll all have to overcompress when we first start doing this. Mm -hmm. And then you end up having to sort of back away from that because you're trying to bring the, um, transients back into your mix. You want your mix to have a punch again. And the best way to do that is to actually, you know, dial back. So you're not really compressing very much. Um, so yeah, you barely want the needle to move. I, I, I mixed with Tom Lord Algae years ago, he was mixing a record for me. And I remember looking over and, at his compressor, which I think was the Red Series um, compressor, and it was a modified one. But still, it was like the needle just didn't even move. Yeah. You know? So, and that was the first place I saw that and I realized I was like, okay, you know, you're not supposed to necessarily squash it. You can, right. and it can sound cool when you do sometimes. But, yeah. uh, but he did send it to the tape machine. And when it got to the tape machine, he just buried the needles. So <laughs> it hit the tape pretty hard. That was good for rock and roll. So, I mean, those are two good takeaways. It's like, you know, we were mixing rock and roll for sure. And it was like the compressor did a thing to the tone, but it wasn't compressing the music too much. It was letting all the punchiness go through. And then yeah. that was hitting the tape and the tape would naturally kind of soak up the transients of the drums and the punch. Yeah. Um, so I think that, Part of those decisions have to be, depending on the music you're doing, you know, if you're doing something that's, um, you know, it needs to be really transparent, then you might not want to have much action going on with a compressor. You might not want to change the tone. You might decide that it doesn't even need a compressor on the mix, you know, and you really need to just put it on and bypass it and turn it back on and listen and trust your ears and see if you like one versus the other the way it sounds. Um, right. and, and, and the last takeaway too, is just this concept of, um, you know, what, what matches, matches the genre. If it's rock and roll and it's sort of old school, then, uh, it was probably mixed through a compressor or through a console, probably hit tape. And that's probably all part of the sound that you need to recreate in order to kind of have it do its thing. If right. it's, you know, electronic music then it's probably mixed in a computer, all the best stuff that you like. And, mm -hmm. you know, you might be using something like isotope ozone on it and multiband and, you know, really kind yeah. of manipulating it a bit and getting the pumping sound. Yeah, I like using the Wave C4 multiband compressor uh, on, on, usually I have it on my master bus because, you know, it lets you, it lets you um, kind of clean up the low mids a little bit more uh, while, you know, leaving the highs and the high mids uh, less compressed or less uh, less affected. Yeah, and I feel like it, it's uh, when I was at Nam, I think a couple of years ago, I was uh, watching Greg Wells at Waves talk about talk about one of his mixes, and he had the 
yeah, the one of the Waves multiband, the mastering uh, multiband compressor, and he was just killing the low mids. And he just called it like, yeah, it's like all this dirt in this area. I just try to like squat, like not squash it, but like really tame it because it seems to open up the rest of the mix so much too. Yeah. Um, so one last thought too about the tempo thing with compression. I remember seeing Chris Lard Algae talk about this and I started practicing it and really liked it is, <clears throat> especially when you're doing subtle stuff, it's hard to know what those differences are. And so, you know, when you're exploring the attack time and the release time, crank your threshold down, like compress the crap out of it for a second and listen to it to see which what they're doing and pick one that you like the most where it's, you know, it's more extreme. It's like you're shining a bright light on your sound and then back it off to where you actually want the threshold to be. And same thing with the release. You know, the release is going to let go and you might start noticing that it, you know, it breathes better against the tempo of the song and where the next kick happens or the next snare happens. Yep. Um, and that'll really help you you understand it better. And then, you know, like I say, back it off again so that it's barely moving the needle. Hey, everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to MixMasterBundle.com Enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. All right, cool. So this next question comes in from Alfredo. And um, Alfredo says, my main question is about the weight of the bass. This is a longer one, uh, yeah. but I think it's a good question. I'm talking about the whole bass, the lows, better said, and not about the instrument bass. Sure. Um, I've noticed that in my mixes, I'm using too much lows. I'm trying to compete with the commercial stuff. I'm checking my mixes on my Bose mini sound link. Um, and I notice my mixes trend to activate, or they tend to activate kind of compression in the Bose speakers. So that's another topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. How could I measure the exact quantity of low if I don't have big speakers? This is the real question here. Yeah. Um, he says when he was young, he used to go to studios in his own city where they'd have NS10s. Uh, but they'd also have the big speakers up up in the back, the soffit mounted, mounted speakers, you know, um, and that he would reference the mixes on those and really get a sense of what it was like in the club, uh, or he'd have a club to go to and you'd get a feel for it. But what if you don't have that? You know, you're in your home studio. He says he's mixing on the Alesis M1 Mark IIs now. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you really know how to check the low end? That was a lot of questions in once. Ready, set, go. <laughs> yeah, well, I I I prepared. So <laughs> let me just. Uh, I think this is a great uh, opportunity to read a little bit from the step by step mixing book, if you want. Great. Uh, because the final chapter is uh is about translation and monitoring your mix and making making it translate across all speakers. So I have sort of a. I guess a seven step process to do this, and uh, if you want me to just kind of go through them. That'd be cool. Seven's a lucky number. All right. So I start my mix by mixing in mono on the on my um, baritone, Behringer Baritone Mix Cube. 
um, you know, mostly following the steps I've given in the in the previous chapters there. Uh, and the mix cube is a terrible speaker that has no low end or highs. It has only one driver and sounds pretty terrible. However, if I can make my mix sound halfway decent on this speaker, I know I'm getting somewhere. So after that, I flip my mix over to my Yamaha HS5s and do another round of tweaking. This is usually a rebalancing effort on EQ, but I also flip my mix out of mono at this point. Now I can hear the stereo spectrum pretty well. If I get the whoa, my mix really opens up, even though it wasn't sounding bad before, I know I'm on the right track. I'll spend some time on reverb, delays, and other effects. Then I listen to my mix on my Focal CMS 50s, which are my uh, sort of nicer uh, nicer monitors and they and they're coupled up with a subwoofer as well so i can really hear the lows at that point and uh, now i can really hear all the little things in the mix as well as all the low end that's present usually this requires me to tweak the drums kick bass and other low end instruments so it's good to have a subwoofer but i did i did get away with not using a subwoofer for years so it's not don't put that at the top of your list necessarily but uh, it's good to maybe and just just as an aside on a tangent, it's good to have maybe one speaker system in your house. It could be your surround system of your TV that has a subwoofer so you can just kind of hear the hear the lows uh, at, at some point in so, at, at some point in the chain of translation. So once I feel my mix is done, I bounce it out and upload it to Dropbox. I take the dog for a walk and listen to my mix multiple times on earbuds, making mental notes of what needs to be changed. Then I either tackle the mix right away or I sleep on it and come back to it with fresh ears. Throughout this process, I tend to check the mix on a, uh, with a high-end pair of headphones every so often to make sure nothing is screwy with the reverb and effects. Once I've done my revisions, I usually get feedback from my studio partner before sending it to the client. If the client has any feedback, I change the mix accordingly and send him the final mix. So basically the, the purpose of this chapter is notice how many different pairs of both speakers and individual ears the mix goes through before I call it done. So you don't want to rely on one single monitor setup in one room to make your final mix decision. You want to make sure your mix translate well everywhere the mix will be listened to. Totally, man. I think that's really good advice. I was going to throw out some other things. Um, you know, the car for me is always a number one place to listen to stuff and where I feel totally. like I can tell if I got it right. But I was thinking about like the club system and it's like, the you know, that does sound different than my car. Um, yeah. You know, I think if you can, I was thinking you could actually, you know, if there's a high-end stereo store in, in town, just show up there, you know, and, you know, go listen to your mix on their stereo, whatever, you know, I mean, they, you know, they might kick you out after a few times like that, or they might welcome yeah. you as somebody who's bringing cool stuff over there. Um, yeah. But again, having other people and trusted ears and friends that you can reference it against, um, you know, the internet is a great place to... Uh, reach out. Obviously, if you don't trust the feedback you're getting, that doesn't help. But if you can find a community where you do trust people's feedback, um, you've got one built into mixing with five plugins, yep. you can start bouncing it off people who do have low end and they can give you some some thoughts about it. Uh, and that really helps, I think, as far as knowing what's going on with it. Um, and yeah. then also, do you use your real-time analyzer sometimes to get a feel for it? You can tell if something's really screwy with the low end. Yeah, I have my vo I have a Vox Engo span, and uh, I just have it, you know, on the master bus. So it's always good to check to see if the if it looks a little lopsided, and it usually tells me where I should be focusing my efforts if I need to cut the lows or add the lows. So yeah, for sure. And then uh, my studio partner Chase, he actually is a live engineer, and he works over at this place called The Rock, and they have a huge, you know. It's a it's a rock and roll venue, and they have a huge speaker system there. So he usually cranks them out there to hear hear what um, what it sounds like there. So that's perfect. Yeah, if you can yeah. find somebody with the club, go do that. <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to flip that question on its head a little bit, literally. So we were talking about low end, but I've also gotten questions from some rock stars asking about high end. So you know, I'm I'm approaching fifty. Um, I have a lot of listeners that are 50 up to 60, up to 70 even, and it's just a natural progression of our hearing that we begin to lose high end. I think it was, um, I just did an email about this recently, and by the age 30, by age 30, most of us have lost some hearing compared to our 20s, right? Um, yeah, it's, and usually, uh, it's usually 1K or 1,000 kilohertz every 10 years 
Yeah. So say you start at 20, being able to hear up to 20 K, um, you know, by age 30, you're, you've probably lost, uh, you're probably down to 17 K. Yeah. Well, belie- you know, that's believe it or not, science, of course, but yeah. Right. And believe it or not, the, um, frequencies, uh, charts that I saw online by the time you're 60, you actually hear like 8 K and above 40 DB down from you did from where you were at 20. Wow. So it's That's really crazy. remarkable, but um, I'll, I'll try and answer this quickly. Uh, I met David Blackmer years ago. I had the the pleasure to be able to interview him. Um, it's long before I had my podcast. Sorry, rock stars, I don't have an episode with him. But he founded uh, DBX Industries, and he also founded Earthworks microphones and speakers they make now. And so here's a guy who's was in his sixties. Who told me that he's uh, well? Let me back up. So here's a guy in his 60s who's making microphones that measure all the way up to 30 kilohertz, you know, above human hearing, all the way up to 50 kilohertz, and he's trying to design speakers that will reproduce this because he hears the difference. But he also told me that he barely hears tones above 8k at that point in his life. Wow. So then you're like, wow, how is it possible that you can? Um, design this stuff and really understand it if you can't hear the high frequencies. And he said, because he does, you actually hear the way it all interacts. You hear the way it folds back into the lower frequencies and your brain adjusts to compensate for what your ears are delivering you. So uh, my point is when you're wondering about hearing the highs in a mix and you're wondering if stuff is um, too harsh or too sibilant in the upper frequencies, if you don't hear them as clearly, um, A, trust what you do here. Uh, and and sort of go with that and let yourself be informed as to whether it se- seems to sound right to you. And B, don't be afraid to just use other people's ears, you know, like yeah. find some people who are in their 20s and bounce it off them. Just say, hey, yeah. does this will sound too harsh, sound too sibling? If they're like, no, it sounds great, then quit worrying about it. Yep. <laughs> and use a real-time analyzer. That's the other one. That'll show you high-frequency stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you want it to sort of naturally curve down uh, after about – what, 10K? No, maybe five. Yeah, there's sort of like a downward slope. If you've got a nice level downward slope of the whole mix in your RTA, then you're doing the right thing. I don't remember exactly what the angle is, but yeah. I feel like if you put up pink noise, you'd see that naturally. It's like an equal yeah, yeah, energy yeah. productive. Yeah. Yep, exactly. All right, so um, let's go to this next question, which comes from uh, John. Fernando. And he says, uh, how can I get better at identifying frequency problems to fix them with EQ? It's a great question because it's so basic. How can I use EQ to its full potential? Um, I have have a very simple solution. It might not be the one he wants, but it's uh, you just have to mix more and practice. And apps such as Quiz Tones that uh, our friend Dan uh, founded is a really good app to have. It's dirt cheap and helps you out identifying frequencies. And then practice EQing is just, is basically the best way to do that is to just mix more music. So there's a bunch of multitracks online. You can go to the Cambridge site, Mike Senior's multitrack vault, and you'll never, you'll never run out of songs to practice with. Yeah, so it's interesting because the question is like identifying frequency problems to fix them. So that is one of the first challenges. You know, we we often hear a sound and we accept it as what it is at face value. And when you begin practicing subtractive EQ, for example, you begin to see the power in how it can correct a sound that's really not sounding balanced when you first hear it. Um, And there's a lot of the stuff that we record in home studios where the shape and the size of the room greatly interacts with and interferes with the sound that we're recording, and we may not realize it. So that's what subtractive EQ can do. So for example, a sound that's in a small space, it might have buildup around um, 400 hertz or, or 200 hertz or whatever. And so as you pull those frequencies out, it starts to sound more balanced. But again, just practice, right? Yeah. Um, all, right, all right, Groovy. Um, this one comes from Jay Tyrone. He just said, um, can you answer one through five? So he just wanted tips on everything. So I think we're doing that and, and we'll just yeah. kind of skip on to the next one here. <laughs> um, and this one comes in from, uh, I don't know how if I'm going to pronounce it right, Mahdi um, or Moti. 
Uh, he says, uh, Modi says, EQ to bus folder like group drums or bass. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the question, if I'm going to rephrase it, is bus folder means, you know, you're busing. If you're subgrouping yeah. drums and bass, what are some appropriate EQs to add to those subgroups? What do you think about uh, that? For drums, I try to not be too heavy handed on the on the drums when they're all grouped because you know say i want if i just want low end from the kick it's easier just to go eq the kick but getting the drums to sound you know sort of more together will uh, i i tend to limit myself to sort of a channel strip that has maybe only four bands or whatnot um and using a, a non-graphic eq it makes you really listen to what you're doing and it helps me. Um, it helps me make better choices, even though they're subtle. And you know, a being a lot uh, to make sure that you're actually making it sound sound better is obviously very important as well. But you know, some some general areas. Obviously, this depends on how how the drums sound to begin with. But I tend to cut at 300 or 400 because it usually cleans up the boxiness, uh, usually opens up the drums a little bit more. Um, if it, if they're sounding a bit, bit boomy, I'll do a, you know, one or two dB cut in the lows, you know, somewhere around a hundred to 250. Um, I tend to add maybe some attack in the, in the high mids. And then if it needs some air or if they need to be brighter, um, you you can give them some air by you know boosting a, with a shelf EQ uh, above ten, but sometimes you run into the run into issues with the symbols being too harsh, and then you sort of do the opposite. Or I I I tend to hunt more in the low mids for the symbol sounds that are harsh because I don't necessarily want to eliminate the high frequency sheen from the cymbals. I'm trying to get rid of the trashy, trashiness sound of it when, you know, say somebody's uh, hitting a china really hard and it's just kind of. That's usually when it, I fire them from the session. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so like getting rid of that's that's harshness that isn't air you're that isn't you know high end that's harshness so you you need to look into the area where the harshness resides and usually that's in the high mids to uh, around 2k maybe to 4k you know yeah good tips I, I think another way to look at eqing um <clears throat> group buses is uh, you could start out by just getting a rough balance of the drums with no EQ on any of the individual drums and then yep. go to the stereo bus and just sort of do some gentle EQing to just kind of reshape it. If it feels a little dark, brighten it slightly, whatever. Um, exactly. Or cut some of the subs if you want. Yeah, yeah once you've gotten a good le level and, and nothing's been EQ'd, uh, a lot of times you just try to listen to the track and, and, and ask yourself, like, what does this sound need? What, what is it missing? Is it, you know, is it missing punchiness? Is it missing low end? Like, does it need more weight? Right. You know, it's almost like ask, ask yourself questions. Uh, if you have ever had an EQ on your home stereo or in the car stereo, just um, in the same way that you sort of brighten it or uh, treat the bass slightly, think about your subgroup folder like that. Just a little bit of EQ, like you're listening to the stereo, and then go in and start addressing the individual drums yeah um all right let's let's keep jumping forward we got a few more questions and, and we're, we've been going for a little while so let's uh yeah. let's see if we can uh blaze through here this one cool. comes in from fred and fred says um well, his one's a little longer but as a background in my situation i mainly look for examples of how to use the tools that allow me to hear what somebody's done with the tool example how to get a fine clicking sound on an acoustic guitar by using the attack release just so on a compressor. You know, you shared something about the snare that was really helpful about there. Um, yeah. He wants to know if we want to share any particular tips like that, you know, anything that you want to share from mixing with five plugins or from the book that is like a trick for how to get this kind of thing going. I'll throw some ideas out there in case you're thinking. Um, sure. Any, any good tricks for the kick or any good tricks for making uh, reading the bass better in a mix or from uh, or from vocal getting vocals to come forward for the kick it seems like there's a an interesting correlation between the the harder the genre the higher you look in the high mids for the beater in metal 
you're going up to maybe 4K and boosting 4K to really get that click sound. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, but in if you're just doing rock or folk, maybe you're just like adding a little bit of presence to the kick in um, in like one one to two K. Right, exactly. Like it, um, if you gave it the brightness that a metal kick has, and you're in an acoustic, you know, groovy rock song, it's going to sound, it's going to stick out horribly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't. Doesn't fit with the genre. Um, but in a metal band, you need to have that because otherwise, you won't even hear the attack of the kick against all the guitars and stuff. Another kind of a interesting trick I like doing on vocals is uh, doing parallel compression. I send the vocal to a bus. I add parallel compression. Usually, it's an opto. I like putting an LA two way on there. Uh, I also use the R Vox a lot because it's like one of the simplest compressors in the world because you only have the one slider and then you just slide it down until it sounds good to you. But then after you've compressed it, and you kind of hit it a little bit hard, you compress it a lot in parallel. But then after that, you add a stereo imager to uh, kind of widen that compressed vocal. And it kind of gives an, an interesting presence to the vocal mix. Um, so I'll throw out one that I think is kind of a good trick for bass too, because we haven't talked about saturation a lot. But sometimes you can't hear the note of the bass part. You've got enough low end and stuff. And if you mm -hmm. try an EQ, you know, 800 hertz or something into it, that can help 500 hertz, 800 hertz could help bring out the note of the bass a little bit more because it's the upper harmonics of the, of the yeah. fundamental. But saturation is a great way too because that, yeah. that sort of brings out harmonic content and really yeah. helps you read the low part in the upper frequencies. Yeah, and parallel saturation especially, because yeah. then you can you can you know send it to it and you can kind of get a little heavier handed on the saturation, but blend it in so that it isn't actually distorted, you know. So and, and but it'll it'll boost your mids so that they become more it has more definition. Yeah. So in Pro Tools, when I'm mixing in Pro Tools, a, a free plugin for that would be the Sans amp, for example, that uh -huh. allows me to really dial it in like a distorted guitar and I can shave off all the lows if I want and blend it back in. I know you mix a lot in Logic. Are there some really great plugins there as well that are good for saturation like that? The only plugin that's really a saturator in a way, I mean, they have a bunch of distortion plugins and uh, the Big Crusher is used to like really get grainy and very distorted. But if you dial the saturation setting all the way back, It'll just add a little bit of a uh, little bit of saturation. Oh, instead. that's cool. That's cool. But but I use the uh, I use the Kramer tape from Waves. I use Fab Filters Saturn, which is uh, incredibly versatile. And then I have uh, the Plugin Mix Analogger, which is uh, an incredibly simple plugin. All, as are all of the Plugin Mix plugins actually. And those are the three saturation plugins I talk about in both step-by-step -step mixing and mixing with five plugins. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's jump forward to the next question. This one comes from uh, Micah and Micah wants to know um, about effect stuff like delay and reverb. Um, yeah. He says, for reverb, what are you looking for? Like, how does it sound? Is it supposed to make the listener feel like they're in a different place? Or is it more to like fill in the gaps because we're used to hearing sounds bounce off everything? And then he comments, I have several kiddos to my name, so it gets noisy. I think he's talking about like, you know, crazy just stuff, <laughs> sound flying around the house. Maybe your speakers yeah. are in different places. So that's an interesting way to put it. Um, and then the second question is regarding delay. Uh, I try to use multi-tap delay when I run live sound gigs and fill in when the lead vocalist holds a phrase for a while. So I'll throw it in there. Um, I try to tap to the kick and snare, um, or should it be kick and kick, like one and three? I try to add it in my studio mix, but I can never land it right. One guy yeah. I interned for, he says he's a middle Tennessee grad, would take the lead vocal, copy it to a new track, and move it over on the grid and cut out the phrases he didn't want. So there's a few different things in there. Um, yes. Tackle any so, of those that you want to start with. Yeah, so the, the molting of the vocal is uh, an incredibly efficient way to add in uh, random repeats and, and sort of, you know, kind of change the arrangement a little bit. If you want to add, uh, if you don't want to have to program your delay and automate your delay to like to, to do that one, you know, one delay or one repeat, then you can create a new track and you, you know, you copy it down there. It's super easy for the 
delay of whether it should be the kick and snare and the kick and kick. That really just depends on whether you want a quarter note, half note, or an eighth note delay. You know, right. you just ta- you just tap it to the tempo that you want and to the division of the of the measure. Right. And so to comment on that, I think that you don't have to think about it too. I think you can tap it to the tempo and then you just change the delay setting according mm-hmm. to that tempo. You know, if you pick the quarter or the eighth or whatever, it'll be faster or slower. So right. there isn't like a one right way to use the tap tap delay. Right, because sometimes uh, I have a tap tempo delay unit in, at the radio station I, I volunteer at. And when we do live bands, uh, I use the tap tempo a lot, especially for the vocals. It's sort of set to the vocal plate plus delay, plus the mono, I think it's a mono delay. I use the tap tempo always depending on what style of music it is and what how fast or slow the song is. You know, if it's a ballad that has space enough for, you know, the repeats to sort of be, you know, washing around in the spectrum, then I'll tap slower. But if I just want kind of a thickness to the vocal, I'll tap very fast, almost, you know, probably 16th note division so that it's not necessarily as noticeable as a delay more than just a... A vocal thickener. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, cool. So uh, I'll see if I can comment a little bit on this too. Uh, Mike, I also have kids in my house and it gets uh, noisy around my place as well. I'm not sure exactly your meaning of the first part of the question, but you did so say, is it supposed to make the listener feel like they're in a different place? That's really, it's a taste issue. So uh, sometimes I use reverb to create a real effect, you know, like you're trying to transport the mix to a new place. And sometimes I use it where it's just meant to sort of enhance what's already going on, you know, the natural positioning and panning of all the instruments. So I think you have to decide on that. And and probably I would sum it up by saying that the reverbs that are meant to sound like a real effect are kind of extreme, you know, they're really obvious. And then the ones that are meant to um, just sort of enhance and create the sense of space around it are much subtler, like, you know... it, you sort of when you mute them and they go away, then you notice it. But if you, you, but when you hear them in the mix, you don't. You wouldn't say you notice them as much, you know. Right. Yeah. So when I'm when I'm trying to automate, uh, there's a, a metal mix that I, I did the other day that they loved. This stuff I did for them was there was a sort of an intermission or like a, a tempo change, and and the, the song got a lot slower. So I took the last hit of the snare. And put it, molted it to another track, and then I automated. Um, I think it was a huge reverb that had some weird modulated effects associated with it in the impulse response. That then went into a delay that was uh, almost an infinite delay, sort of on a loop. And then that went into another reverb that was, you know, probably even larger than the last one. It was some sort of um, some sort of space, you know, they're like emulating like space station, you know, big, huge droney noises and, 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 and all that. And then I automated it to create this sound texture in the middle, in the background of the mix, uh, to basically create this huge sense of space that was just kind of, and gave it a sort of a floaty feel because, and the contrast between, you know, the hard hitting fast metal part that preceded it. And then it goes straight into the, this hard, you know, outro again. And the, the contrast between the floaty reverb space and, uh, and then the dry gives the, gives the, the listeners something very interesting to hear and, and, and creates contrast and texture in the mix. So I, Rockstars, I would also say that the other extreme, you know, the, the place that you're often likely to add a reverb that really is just trying to tuck itself in there is a snare room sound. So like on a mix, uh, again, you were just talking about a snare and sort of as an effect, but when you're just sort of building a rock and drum kit, the snare can often kind of get, start to sound dead and and a little lifeless sitting into within a lot of distorted guitars. And sometimes you have to put another medium room, small room sound on it to sort of breathe more life into it. If you want to be really lazy on your reverb selection, uh, just find a reverb mode, maybe a hall or a room, depending on the genre and the feel of the song you want, and just put it on 10% wet and on, on the master fader. Like it's, it'll just give de- depth to everything while not being really a 
player in the song at all. It's just yeah. Uh, it's it's a it's a cheat and it's a really lazy way of using reverb, but it's fast and efficient. <laughs> it does work pretty well. I guess I kind of do that with my plate reverb sometimes, where yeah. I'll have it in the mix and I'm just sending a little bit of everything to it, and right. it sort of glues it together in a way. You know. Yeah. All right. So here's another question. This one comes in from Trevor. Trevor says. Hey, I've been struggling with vocals lately, indie rock. I'm really happy with the audio I'm recording, but I just can't get it to sit nice in the mix. It sounds flat and lifeless compared to the rest of the mix. I tend to use a mix of digital plate reverb and hall reverb, and I've been blending in a heavily compressed and slightly distorted double of the track and using a subtle multi-tap delay on the vocal bus. Both help, but it's still just not quite there. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Um, looking forward to the episode. Cheers. This actually came in through our Facebook questions too. So that's mm. great. Um, so I feel like you tackled some of these already, yeah. but, um, you know, again, getting the effects right and stuff, it's one of the things that uh, really does help something not sound flat and lifeless in the mix, yeah. you know, whether it's the vocal or the snare. Do you have any responses to that one, that question? Uh, well, it's funny because what he's saying he's doing sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm like, this is cool. I need to try this. But you know, if it's, if it's not quite there because it just doesn't get it to sit night and well, sound, he says sounds flat and lifeless to me, that sounds like it might be either too compressed or not EQ'd enough to, to punch out of the mix in the high mid. So like, a uh, boost in three to five K to get it to kind of like, you know, kind of attack the listener a little bit more. And if it is uh, too compressed, maybe using more compression on a parallel bus instead of on um, instead of on the track itself to sort of get it to, to, to kind of get that excitement in your face. Yeah, well, you know? and you know, and there could just be other things that are fighting and getting in the way. Like maybe it sounds cool by itself, but once you put it into the mix, there's too many other elements that are just crowding around it. I, I, I there's one thing that stands out to me though. You said digital plate reverb and hall reverb mix, and I remember something that always stuck with me. One of one of my teachers in college at Middle Tennessee State University said, um, "Don't." put me in too many rooms in a mix, or I get really confused if you put me in more than one room. And the takeaway from that was, you know, I think a lot of students would put a whole different reverb on every single thing that they would do and then blend it all together and you start to get confused. So that could be something too. Maybe you just got too much. You're not sure what effect you're supposed to be listening to when you listen, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Sometimes too much processing is actually uh, yeah, a negative thing. Too little good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. So now here's another question. This one comes in from Eric. Eric says, um, I look forward to you explaining saturation, tape emulation, and console specifically, because after years of trying it, I just don't get it, in quotes. I have access to Slate Virtual Tape Machine and Virtual Console as a subscriber, and I hear experienced mixers say how wonderful they are on videos and interviews and all over the internet talking about glue and warmth and 3D qualities. But I hear almost no difference when I use them on my very amateur mixes. I guess I may have fried my ears in front of loud guitar amps over the years. I know it's a general question, but I just need help knowing what I am listening for when it applies to these types of plugins. So what uh, do you think about that? Well, I think saturation is a pretty subtle thing. It isn't it isn't necessarily something that is an effect. It is um, having saturation on a bunch of mixed buses is a great way to do tiny little mix moves at the time that maybe one doesn't doesn't actually you know affect the mix all that much. But once you've added in saturation levels throughout the mix, you kind of get something more than the sum of its parts in a way. Well, I can't help thinking of the expression um, "lipstick on a pig." You know, if you put you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And, and I, <laughs> I'm not trying to pick on you, Eric. That was by your own admission. But I mean, you know, if you feel like the mix maybe isn't happening, yeah. then putting something subtle on like this 
may it's not going to really make the big change that might be needed. So I might be misinterpreting what you're saying, but it, it's pretty subtle. It's definitely subtle. Sometimes you have to take it out of context. You have to hear it in some different places. And sometimes with things like tape and console, you need to experience a little bit of that natural built-in compression and limiting that they do. You know, when the drums, when you push the drums up into them, they hit it harder and and it soaks it up and that's what makes it work. You know, it gives it that quality of reminding you of an old record, for example. Right. So to me, uh, it sort of goes down to the, I like analyzing and problem solving tracks in solo and then I tweak in context. So, you know, learning to listen to saturation, do it in solo. Um, but of course, if you're doing it on the bus, like the entire master bus, then, you know, there's nothing to solo. But but make sure that you can't, you're can't. you constantly always a being, especially when you're trying to teach yourself something new, uh, understanding the difference when it's on and off and what it's doing. Uh, it's, you know, that's a, it's a learning process and it takes a while. Yeah. And by understanding, it means trusting what you hear too. So yep. sometimes the only way to do it is to just turn it on, turn it off and see if you feel one way or the other when you hear it, you know, um, just make a quick decision on it. And also, you know, final takeaway, Eric, is you don't have to like all those things that you listed. Like there's no rule that says you have to like what everybody's telling you on videos. Sounds great. If you like it without it, then, you know, you're good to go. All right, exactly. cool. So, um, any more? Anything else on that one, Bjorkman? Or we got one more question lined up here. Yeah, no, let's keep going. Okay, so this one comes from Naren, if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, says, "Hey, it'd be great if you guys can talk about using really short delays and reverbs to fatten up things like guitars, vocals, and drums." So, I think that's a good question. And and um, what what do you want to share about the powers of short delays and short reverbs? Sure, I have a I have a few here. Uh, one of the things I really like on guitar solos, for instance, is um, using a stereo delay with one repeat. You can either do if you want it really short, you can do uh, and it, where it's sort of just like a double track for depth. You can do on one side twenty milliseconds, the other side thirty milliseconds. If you want a little more of a solo sound, little more you know Satriani or or. Uh, you know, any any of those lead guitar players take the delay up to 100 milliseconds instead, but still one repeat. That means that uh, the one repeat is just sort of thickening it up. It's not, you know, ping-ponging and getting in the way. It's just sort of accenting the, the solo itself. For vocals, uh, I like, and this actually works on um, snare as well, is having like a 0.3 second reverb on vocals uh, where it's more about giving them depth than actually giving them space. Nice. Um, I love using short delays uh, and short reverbs. I'm probably more inclined to use short delays on things. Yeah. Sometimes a shaker track, if you put a really short delay behind it, it kind of livens it up and it sits, it pulls it back from the speakers and sits it back into the drum sound a little bit more. And again, yep. that would be a single repeat. It wouldn't be multiple repeats, you know? Right. Um, and then another great trick is a widening trick. So if you've got a mono sound and it's going to be panned over to the left, for example, um, rather than just having it just sit there, you can do a short delay of it, uh, maybe darken it slightly even if you want to, and pan that over to the right. And that gives the whole sound sort of this wide stereo feel to it that can be really cool. So that's, that's a, a cool way to just kind of use a short delay in a simple way. For sure. Well, did you have any more questions? Any anybody that we didn't get to? Yeah. So I've got um, an, I got a question from Sean. He said, uh, "I find one of the issues I have most trouble with is phase and phase canceling when I EQ elements in my mix. Sometimes I hear the areas fade out. I believe that it's canceling itself out due to phase EQ EQ phase shifts. Do you have any tips or pointers? Phase is a fun topic to talk about because it's it's like the I feel like all of the purists come out of the woodwork uh -huh. when you start talking about phase because as soon as you mistake phase for polarity or vice versa, you get, you know, hated on on the internet. Right, right. Um, but, you know, for, say you want to make sure your drums are in phase, uh, like the easiest thing to do is just put a phase plugin or or, a, or an EQ plugin that has a phase or, or, excuse me, a polarity button. Right, right. <laughs> 
and uh, and you click it, and if it sounds noticeably worse, then you know that it's you know the other in phase is better or out of phase is better. But uh, that's one way to do it. And uh, but the other way is to I tend to align my drum tracks to the snare drum so that all of the waveforms are going up and down, you know, crests and was it troughs going right. up and down in the at, at the same time so that they're not um, even the overheads. If you have overheads or room mics that are like far away, moving them slightly so that they're in um, polarity with each other is uh, is definitely can help you know, thickening things up and tightening up a lot of the frequency imbalances through through multi mic instruments, for sure. Well, I mean, you know, when I hear the question, and he's asking about EQing and hearing phasing, that it's a little confusing to me because you really, if you're EQing stuff, you shouldn't you shouldn't be reversing polarity anywhere. But maybe he's just hearing, you know, some the way the the time shifting's happening, and he's hearing a little bit of smearing in there or something like that too. So yeah. again, you got to trust your ears. Maybe try the different, you know, switch it from zero latency to natural phase to linear phase EQ if you've got those options. But uh, you right. know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean polarity. I, I always mix up phase and polarity. I mean, we're just talking about getting all them waveforms to kind of line up together. You know, go go the same direction. Right. Right. And, and Rockstar is a reminder that. All that really means in the end, remember, everything just translates down to that speaker that's sitting in front of you. It's either moving towards you or it's moving away. And when things yeah. get out of phase, you're just your speaker's getting confused and that's in your ears getting confused, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I got one more question. I think it's a good good one to sort of close out. Uh, I had some more questions from, from my audience, but I think we sort of tackled them uh, w with the other questions that we answered. So. Cool. Um, I don't think they'll get super mad if I don't tackle their particular question. But uh, this one is pretty good. Uh, he says, it's from Armin. Yes, I think I have a question regarding mixing in general. We get advice to compare or mix with some others out there. So reference tracks, reference mixes, etc. To compare what we do with something commercially. Well, the question is, how accurate is this since we compare our mix track with a master track out there will it still be relevant we don't have others mixes on master to compare to so when this happens i literally compare my mix with a master piece is that helpful still thank you classic so, question man Cla yeah, i've yeah. asked it so many times in the past yeah and i'll answer it with sort of a story in another way so if you set yourself goals to reach you should always set yourself sort of a big, hairy, audacious goal, which is a goal that is uh, almost unreachable. But you know that if you try just hard enough, you might get you might get there. Yeah. And and it also means that if you try really, really hard and don't get there, but you might get 50 percent of the way there, you've probably made a lot of massive changes to get to where that is. A good example of that is, say you want to make a million dollars, but you only get to the point where you're making $500,000. I think making a $500,000 is a significant like life change. So think of it that way. And in a, in a mixing context, it is, if you can get your mix to sound close to a master, that is a, that's incredible. So you should strive for your reference tracks to be almost unreachable uh, because if you get close enough to that, then you've tried harder than if you just pick any commercial mix that might not actually sound that good. And then you're comparing yourself to, you know, something that is on just an average piece of mi piece of music yeah. instead of striving to be get closest to the best. Yeah, that's good advice, man. Um, <laughs> my personal analogy for setting the big, hairy, audacious goal was the first time I decided I had taken up barefoot running and I decided I was going to train for the Nashville Marathon to run yeah. it completely barefoot. I mean, with no shoes on at all. And I, and I trained and trained and I finally had to, I just couldn't take it, you know, it was like it hurt too much. Yeah. And I ended up uh, finally deciding, well, I'm just going to kind of run the half marathon and I guess I'll give up on my my goal. And I ran it. And then afterwards, I was like, wait a minute, I just ran a half marathon barefoot, yeah. you know? <laughs> right. So, you know, I, but it was only by setting the goal and, and sort of reaching for it that I got to that first part. If I had set that first goal, I don't even know if I would have gotten there. Right. 
Um, right. Another takeaway, rock stars, for the mix compared to master thing is remember to turn your master down. You need to judge them. Oh yeah, at level same match for sure. Level, same volume, and level match them so that you're judging. You know, you're not influenced by one just because it's simply louder. Yeah, for and sure. And then last takeaway is that um, when I have spoken to mastering engineers in the past, I think Bob Ludwig was one of the first ones that we asked this question to. It was like, what should we do to our mix to make it right for you to master? And th their answer was just like, you just get it exactly where you want it to sound and then deliver it to me. It wasn't like, get it almost there and then the mastering will do this last trick for you. Right. You know, their attitude was like, you know, you make it sound right and then we'll master it. So yeah. I think I think that's a good takeaway. It's like you keep pushing as far as you can push with your mix and don't like don't think that oh well if I only had this mastered by so and so it would finally sound right. Right. Yeah, it's not a it's not mastering isn't a magic trick. You actually have to give them something great. Now that said, if you do go work with a great mastering engineer, they're of course going to do great stuff to your mixes oh, yeah, and make it sound sure. really good. For sure. But um, all right, cool. Well, Bjorgvin, I guess that sort of wraps up all of our questions. Thank you so yeah. much, Rockstars, for sending your stuff in. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's just kind of super exciting to actually reach out um, through email and Facebook and stuff like that and, and be interacting with everybody like this. I mean, it really brings it to light to me how real this is and our, our connection to all of you and being able to help you with your recordings. I mean, we're all trying to just make better records. So this is a great Really great opportunity, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I'm so happy to be on. It's fun to sort of talk about people's problems and really try to give them some practical solutions. It's it's uh, always a good time. You know, we could we could nerd out about all these topics forever. Uh, it's great but, to yeah to have real questions that people yes. are really needing help with right now. So um, rock stars, I wanted to let you know that Bjorgvin very generously set up a special for us. So. Um, the book is out now. If you want to go check it out, make sure you check out Step by Step Mixing. You can find that on Amazon, and I'll let yeah. Bjorkvin tell us uh, he's got a site for it as well. Yeah, it's just stepbystepmixing.com. It'll take you to the page there, and you can buy from Amazon there. Yeah, I highly recommend you go get that book and give it a read. I think it's extremely affordable as well. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, um, so uh, then, the, then the next up is if you're really ready to sort of take it to the next level, um, go check out Mixing with Five Plugins. And um, Bjorkman actually set up a link for us at rsrockstars.com slash mw5p. So that's actually an affiliate link for me and Recording Studio Rockstars. If you use that, I will actually get a small commission on it, which is great, and I appreciate that. The price is exactly the same. You, there's no difference in cost. In fact, we actually have a better price for you. <laughs> uh, Bjorgen, did you said you had something set up for the rock stars. Yeah, so if you use the RSR50 when you check out uh, and, and become a member, you actually can get $50 off. Wow, man, that's awesome, dude. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. So rock stars, save 50 bucks. <laughs> Go through the link and use the coupon. Now, is that only open uh, right now, or is they going to be able to check that out any time? No, it's it's. Uh, I I kept it open this time around. Uh, I opened it up and closed it down every once in a while. But I th I just decided that people, you know, they're always on their own schedule. They should be on their own schedule, and and uh, so it's open for whenever they have you know time to time to spend on learning some more mixing tricks nice so mixing for 12 months a year rock stars awesome well bjorkman thanks again man uh, do you want to let listeners know how they can find out more about you check out your stuff your blog yeah absolutely just uh check me out at audioissues.com um there's all the info is there you can sign up to the email list i have 110 mixing tips from the quick mixing checklist there um that that definitely will get you started and then uh, I email regularly with practical and easy to use tips to, you know, solve your audio issues. Nice, dude. Well, Bjorkman, again, thanks for hanging with us on Recording Studio Rockstars. It's super cool to have you back on the show. You're actually our first repeat guest, man. You, you've you launched this this mothership and, <laughs> and you're back now with some serious advice, too. We, we love it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, happy to be here. This is so much fun. Again, Rockstars, just go to rsrockstars.com slash MW5P. And then if you, you use the coupon code RSR50, and that'll give you $50 off mixing with five plugins. 
And uh, also go check out the book, stepbystepmixing.com. Yep. Bjorgen, we'll see you around the studio, dude. Yeah, take it easy. All right, man. Cheers. Thanks for hanging with us. Absolutely. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.